In this special Wave Rover video, I'm going to share with you the five most important lessons I've learned over a lifetime of adventures at sea. Specifically, my experience is about minimalist solo sailing on the ocean. And I'll just give you a little bit of background very briefly. I've crossed the Pacific a few years back on my home-built 26-foot sloop Wren, and more recently crossing the Atlantic from west to east and again from east to west and then again from uh, the Caribbean right up to the east coast of Canada on my 26-foot Contessa Wave Rover. Now, these are the five areas I want to talk about. They are, number one, seamanship, number two, navigation, number three, the gear you need, or more specifically, the gear you don't need, number four, the finances, how much does something like this cost, and number five, what are the characteristics of a successful solo sailor? Sales. Should they be hanked on or should they be roller furled? We're talking about head sails here. Well, if you've been watching the Wave Rover series, you know my feelings on this. I, I employ hanked on sails and I do it because I, it gives me a variety of sails to choose from depending on the conditions. And this is really important when you're in a small boat because small boats are particularly sensitive to building wind conditions, far more so than a larger craft. With this, I get a number of options. I have uh, a feeling of security knowing that I can sail my boat engineless in light winds by putting up my light wind sails, my medium wind sails, and when the wind starts getting strong, I can reef my working jib, and after that, I have a smaller jib, and after that, I have a storm sail. So I have a lot of options. Uh, to keep me safe out there and to keep Wave Rover uh, sailing, even in conditions that are very hard for a small vessel. The second thing is when you go forward, and for me this is sometimes several times a day to deal with these sails, you uh, develop a lot of confidence in your ability to go forward in different conditions. And it's not just confidence, it's also you develop agility to be able to go forward safely. Uh, one hand for the boat and one hand for yourself and of course you're tied off but you learn to work around all that to get the job done. Uh, and finally being a minimalist solo sailor uh, hanged on sails are simplicity themselves. They are repairable at sea, they are replaceable at sea and they are robust at sea and that's the reason I'll always pick hanked on sails for ocean sailing on a small boat. So let's talk heavy weather tactics. So heavy weather tactics are so important to everybody, but even more important when you're on a small boat on the ocean. So your first line of defense is to shorten sail and reef. And after you get there and you can't go any further, then it's time to heave to. Now, if the conditions are too heavy for heaving to, say uh, a gale, then it may be time, depending on the situation, to run with the seas. And you do that by, uh, you can do that under bare poles if under that much wind. But you need to slow yourself down because what will happen is, as you come down a wave, you can end up broaching. And when you broach, that's when you're going to get into some severe difficulties. So in order to slow yourself down and put yourself back in control, you can stream warps off your stern. And in the uh, one of the earlier episodes of Wave Rover, I do just that on the east to west crossing of the Atlantic. After you've done that, if conditions are still too severe, it's time to deploy your series drogue. So what is a series drogue? Well, a series drogue, well, first of all, let me back up. It all came out of the fast net disaster of 1979, when a number of small boats in the race were uh, demolished by the seas by a storm that they weren't prepared for. So the United States Coast Guard uh, modeled those conditions 
and came up with this strategy for small boats for severe heavy weather. And it was, what came out of that research was the series Drogue. And you can get this research for free just by Googling that. And they will, in that, you will find out how to build these. Now, I've built three of these over the years, one for each of my boats. And it just gives you this incredible sense of security to have this as a last, uh, sort of a last chance or, uh, you know, under the most severe conditions, deploy this and you will be safe. So what does it look like? Well, first of all, you have to attach it to the boat. So you have to install some pretty heavy duty chain plates and you'll install those where the transom meets the hull. It's pretty much the strongest uh, part of the boat. And with these heavy steel chain plates, you attach a bridle and the bridle heads out to a swivel. And from that swivel, you have a long leader. And then attached to that leader, you have another long rope. But on this second long rope, you have a number of small parachutes. The parachutes are about five inches in diameter on the forward end and about three inches in diameter in the after end. And I think they're about five and a half inches in length. And those are attached to that second long rope. And uh, for a boat the size of Wave Rover being 5,500 pounds, I had to have 100 of these cones to, to uh, uh, meet the, the design criteria. And at the end of this long line of cones, then you have a weight, and that just buries the whole thing into the sea. I uh, should have mentioned that you're going to be using a very heavy rope for this. I was using three-quarter inch double braid. Uh, you do not want to cut any corners on this at all. Like you want to make sure that the chain plates are heavy stainless steel, 316, and that they are heavily bolted to the hull, that there are backing plates on the inside of the hull, and that the swivels are oversized and that the rope has never been used or left outside. This is covered up. This is for emergencies only. And there's nothing like the peace of mind I get just from carrying that onto Wave Rover. And in fact, I would make the statement that I would never leave port without one of these. Self-steering. Well, let me just start by saying several years ago, when I crossed the Pacific from the west coast of Canada all the way across the Pacific to Australia, I did so with nothing more than sheet to tiller steering. Now, sheet to tiller steering is a perfectly viable uh, backup, or, or it was my primary actually, but I consider it my backup these days. It's simple and it's easy to deploy, but Operating it is more art than you could imagine. Now, for more precision and ease of use, I designed the Mark III. Now, I called it the Mark III because it really is the third version of this self-steering that I've, I've designed. And by far, this is the best. It has fixed all the problems of the previous two uh, designs. Now, how good is it, the Mark III? Well, it steered Wave Rover 7,800 miles. Took me exactly where I wanted to go. It didn't give me any problems at all. It survived a knockdown at sea, uh, and yet right beside it, a solar panel was totally destroyed, and the push pit was all mangled. But the Mark III survived, no problem. This thing is robust. Now, make no mistake, if you plan to sail across an ocean, you need self-steering. And uh, just in a side note, in a few weeks' time, the next video will be all about the Mark III. I have uh, a few things that I'd like to say about it. But it's going to take me a few weeks to do that video because I want to make sure it's done right. Planning and preparation. Now, a good sailor knows you need resources to be independent at sea, and that means extra cordage, 
uh, sail repair material, rope, construction tools, etc., etc. But equally as important is knowing how to use all these equipment, all this equipment, and how to get the most out of your tools and resources. And finally, a good solo sailor knows what you lack in resources, you must make up for in your resourcefulness. Let me say that one more time. What you lack in resources, you make up for with your resourcefulness. Navigation. Now, navigation is one of those areas that has really changed in the last 30 or 40 years. And by that, you probably know where I'm going with this, e-charts, electronic charts. Uh, they're absolutely wonderful. You know, in the thousands and thousands of dollars it would take to have paper charts of the Atlantic Circuit I did on Wave Rover uh, can all be replaced by 30 or $40 of e-charts. Now those e-charts would have infinitely more information on them than paper charts. But having said that, do we still need paper charts? Well, of course we do. So this is the paper chart that I had taken with me on Wave Rover. It's a chart of the North Atlantic and you probably can't see it in this light, but there are fixes on here representing my noon position every day while at sea. It's important to do that as a backup. Uh, did I need it? No. No. Um, did I even come close to needing it? No. No, I didn't. But it was there. Uh, the second thing that I always take with me on these is a, is a sextant. Now, this isn't an expensive sextant. This is, uh, uh, let's see, what's it called? Uh, Master Davies Instrument Master. It's plastic. Uh, it's surprisingly expensive for a plastic sextant. But between the sextant and just some very, very simple skills that you can pick up, such as a meridian passage and a sun run sun, uh, between those two little techniques, you'll be able to navigate your way across an ocean. And then when you get near land, you switch back to pilotage. What is pilotage? Well, pilotage is heads up navigation. And by that, I mean you have identified your landmarks and your lead marks and you're steering toward them. And every leg or every track of your course, you will have a new lead mark that you'll identify on the previous one. I could talk about this for for hours, but I won't because that's not the main intent of this. The main intent is to say that I rely almost entirely on e-charts, but I do have a paper chart backup and I have a backup in the form of a sextant and a compass that I always have with me. Uh, about electronic charts, so I had my charts loaded onto three devices. I had the majority of my charts on a very good tablet, which was destroyed in the knockdown, but on my second tablet, I had, uh, which was wrapped, wrapped up in bubble wrap and tucked away in the nav station in a place that it wouldn't get hurt by water or by uh, vibration. And I brought that out and it was ready to go. It was loaded with all the charts I needed for that area. Uh, the third thing I had was I had charts loaded onto my inexpensive little uh, smartphone. And uh, I, I practiced with all three of those before I, so that I would be comfortable uh, using them. Now on top of the, uh, the tablets and the phone, what else did I have? I had GPS on my VHF radio. I also had GPS on my inReach Garmin communicator. So I had, let's see, two, three, four, five independent sources of GPS. They all require power, but, but they all, if you stagger it out and you don't have them running all day, you could, on a single charge, you could get right across uh, the ocean. Having said that, just a single solar panel is enough to uh, charge all these items. 
I could speak way more in depth on this subject, and I'm sure a lot of you uh, will complain that I didn't, but there are more things that I need to talk about. The next area I want to talk about is about gear. So I'm a minimalist and I really uh, don't need a lot of gear to go sailing, but because I use e-charts, I do have some gear that I need. So in my case, I relied upon a Samsung tablet and this was pretty inexpensive. I'd say somewhere in the order of about $125 to $150 and I think that was regular price. You can probably get them on sale for, for much less. Uh, this has enough power to load all of your charts on, all the charts you could possibly need uh, just on this one device. So uh, at that price, buy two. You can load with using the same license, you can load Navionics onto more than one device. The second item that I talk about is my VHF radio. Now, things have changed a lot since I did my VHF training in the Navy some th over 30 years ago. Uh, these things are amazing. You know, with this, there's a GPS. Of course, there's the radio, and it's a high-tech radio that you can pre-program emergency uh, responses into. It also has an AIS feature, which is amazing to me. This little unit can see other ships up to about 20, 25 miles away from my masthead VHF antenna. And it'll tell me the course that the ship is steering, uh, the closest point of approach that it'll come to me, the time of that. I can set guard rings around Wave Rover and an alarm will go off if a ship will enter that or is likely to enter that uh, zone. So a pretty amazing piece of kit. And of course, uh, did I mention there's GPS on this as well. And then this tiny little device here, this is an, a Garmin inReach and I use this every day to send a message to Mrs. Rover to, to let her know I was safe. And there were also a couple of times in there where I used this device to um, make arrangements. Well, actually, I sent, an e I sent a message, a text message to Mrs. Rover, and she then made arrangements with marinas to make sure there was room. And that was really handy because I was in heavy weather heading for a port, but that port had no room because of the arc uh, race. So uh, it, it took, it took oh, probably six hours of communicating back and forth for Mrs. Rover to find a marina in the Canaries that had room for me. So it was very handy, very handy indeed. Uh, and did I mention there's GPS on this as well? And then finally, the other piece of kit I carry is a emergency beacon. And this is a good quality ARC emergency beacon. It was uh, it was one of the better ones you could buy at the time. I'm, I haven't kept up with it. it. It was something I did not so much for myself, but I did that for uh, Mrs. Rover and my parents. They insisted upon it. I, I never felt as though I was in danger of needing it, but it, it, you know, it's not a bad thing to have on board. And you want to have it in a place where you can grab it quickly. And I did. I had it just inside the hatch. You know, you're never far from anywhere on Wave Rover. So it was protected from the elements and the sun. And when I needed it, if I needed it, it was uh, easy to reach to and pull up on deck and deploy. There's one other item that I realized I could use, but I didn't have. And that is an AIS transponder. I, I saw the value of AIS when I was out there with the receiver and I thought, wouldn't it be so much better if I had a, trans, a transceiver? So I was sending out my position at the same time as receiving the information from the other ships. Uh, the, the big advantage to that is you can put in some information with Wave Rover. It could be Wave Rover, Solo Sailor, and that way it gives a heads up to folks around you to, um, you know, perhaps be a little more cautious in approaching you, or more likely 
they're going to see you. And when I would contact large ships at sea, they were, they were really good overall getting back to me. I think only one merchant ship didn't get back to me out of the probably 20 or 30 that I contacted. But all of them had difficulty seeing me, so I decided not to contact any merchantmen unless I was within three miles. And three miles gave, gave both of us enough time to maneuver if necessary. And having been on big ships when I was in the Navy, I understand this. You know, I understand how small these boats are in these big waves. Very hard to see uh, uh, navigation lights at night. So whenever I would contact a big ship, I would always give relative bearings and distances from their perspective to where I was to help them find me. Because once they start looking in that right direction, they will see you and then they can take appropriate um, maneuvers. But the point is, if I had an act of AIS, they would have spotted me from 20 or 30 miles back and they would know that I'm a sailboat under sail. So that is the one gadget, if, if you will, that I feel as though I would, I would have next time I'm on a small boat on the ocean. Finances. First of all, I'll put all the numbers in US dollars. So Wave Rover was purchased for approximately $2,500. This was a good deal, yes, but she needed a lot of work. She had cracks uh, all over her deck. Um, she was taking on water in a few spots. The rigging was old, the sails were old. Uh, the next big expense was electronics. I spent approximately $2,000 on electronics. Rigging and sales, uh, being that I, uh, or myself and Mrs. Rover, built the uh, working jib and the drifter. So uh, we had to buy a package from a sail maker to uh, do that where they had pre-cut the panels and we sewed them up and we reinforced the corners and put the bolt rope on and the thimbles. So that was, as I said, about $2,000. The engine was about $1,000. Materials, for example, bolts, fiberglass, plywood, steel, that kind of thing, that ran me about $2,500. In fact, that was the single biggest expense other than the boat itself. Altogether, if you add that up, it comes to $10,000. So that was my refit and the purchase of the boat. So uh, I looked for a boat that would be that cheap. I mean, the boat had uh, the inboard engine had been ripped out. It was in pretty, uh, it was in not the best shape. You certainly wouldn't take it out on the ocean the way it was. It had to be repaired. A lot of, a lot of the uh, changes that have been made to the boat over the years had to be undone and then redone correctly. Uh, now, the second half of finances are operations. So uh, I spent almost a full year, 11 months and change on this voyage. And in that time, I spent about $7,500 US. So that works out to about $600 a month. But that's not really the way you look at it because I had spent over 105 days at sea and the beauty of being at sea is it costs you nothing. So a third of the time I wasn't spending any money but two thirds of the time I was. And I was in port for a lot of that time. Uh, I enjoyed myself. I got together with other sailors. You know, we explored a little bit, but I was in marinas and that can be costly, although nowhere near as costly as I thought it would be in Europe when I was in the Azores. Very, very reasonable. And when I got to the Canaries, it was approximately the same. Uh, you, you have to look for these marinas. They all have slightly different rates, so find one with lower rates. And the second thing is, at 26 feet, you only pay a fraction of what the 40-footers uh, usually pay. Um, part of the reason I stayed in marinas because when you get to the Azores, there's virtually no anchoring uh, anywhere, very little protected anchorage. And when you get to the Canaries, it's the very same thing. But when I got to the Caribbean, there are plenty of anchorages, 
but unfortunately, almost immediately after getting there, the whole world went into lockdown about COVID-19. So I was more or less locked in uh, the port of La Marin on the south coast of Martinique with uh, no option to go to an anchorage. So uh, that's where the money went. $10,000 for the boat and the refit and about $7,500 for operating it, uh, operating it around the Atlantic. It would be my day-to-day -day expenses, my operation expenses, would have dropped off considerably had I, had I made it to the Pacific. But one of the other things that really was a bit of a sore point with me was getting through the Panama Canal. The price for getting through the Panama Canal doubled just this very same year that I needed to go through. So that is a very, very costly event. It was, uh, I think I was, uh, I was estimating it would be three to $4,000 just to get through the Panama Canal, something to consider. But you can live virtually, virtually on nothing in the Caribbean if you're at anchor. Now, in this last segment, I want to talk about what are the characteristics of a solo sailor. And really, I'm talking about myself. Now, in almost everything I do, I'm a minimalist. It's just part of my DNA. I don't need to try, it's just what happens. And when I reflect on it, I think about all the things that I've been able to do because I'm a minimalist. Now, the big positive is that without gadgets and technology, you're in the moment. It's you, the ocean, and a little boat. And that's what this was for me, being as close to nature and the sea as possible, with the least amount of interface. The ocean doesn't give a damn about what race you are or what gender or nationality. The ocean is the great equalizer, rewarding or penalizing you based on your own merit. Showing up isn't enough. Being told that everything will work out isn't enough. As a minimalist solo sailor, this comes down to you and you alone. All the prep and planning, the execution of the plan, that's you. You can't count on outside help. You shouldn't even think about counting on outside help. Now the upside, having prepared and executed well, having crossed an ocean, you'll be rewarded with a huge sense of accomplishment. It's almost impossible to describe, but you will generate a great sense of confidence and rightly so. The number of solo sailors remains a very small number relative to the number of sailors out there. And the number of solo sailors that cross an ocean is an even smaller number and those that cross oceans multiple times in small boats is excruciating or exceedingly small. So why do it? Well, to be among a small number of sailors is not reason enough for me to take this on. The reason I sail solo on the ocean is because of the adventure. And crossing an ocean solo on a small boat is all about adventure. This is part of my nature to test myself. I know from reflecting over the years how important adventure is to me. And all of us will have a unique understanding of what adventure means to us. For me, the adventure must have a certain degree of risk, a certain degree of uncertain outcome. An adventure must have your full attention. You must be living in the moment where every cell of your body is focused on changing the odds to your advantage. You must be task-oriented and engaged fully in the outcome, not just showing up, but leaning in and leading the charge. You must ask yourself, are you comfortable with uncertainty? Are you comfortable with risk? Are you comfortable being alone for weeks on end? And are you comfortable relying purely on yourself? Because the ocean is the great equalizer. 
it can be devastatingly cruel to those who just show up, those who are not prepared for the challenge. I'll leave you with this one last thought. I love the adventure of minimalist solo sailing in a small boat. And every now and then I feel the need to feel connected to the sea, to feel challenged, to test myself. It's then that I feel alive, but it's more than just feeling alive. You feel you have accomplished something completely by yourself without the aid of others. You have done it with the bare minimum on a small boat. The feeling itself is indescribable, but it's a feeling that I wish each one of you will enjoy. In concluding, in the next video, which will be at least two weeks from now, if not more, it will be all about the Mark III self-steering wind vane, as I said. Now, this will have important information concerning the construction. I hope also that you will subscribe and watch and share my new YouTube channel, Rover's Rest, where I embark on my new project, Building a Homestead. And I'll leave a link to that at the end of this video. So until then, my friends, I wish you fair winds.